Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor to present Vice Admiral Jeffrey L. Fowler, Superintendent of the United States Naval Academy. Well, thank you and welcome uh, to a little breezy United States Naval Academy today. It should blow its way out of here, hopefully have a better uh, rest of the week. Uh, but this institution, as I leadership, uh, the most, is the most important focus for our students. And I think you all agree that leadership is required in every endeavor each of us hopes to achieve. I'm particularly pleased that this uh, midshipman or student-run conference continues to attract all of you, a large number of schools and students. This year, the latest count I have is 42 schools and 153 students joining our midshipmen. So thanks for being here and, and traveling to, to get down here. Uh, I'd also like to thank the distinguished speakers who will kick off the conference today. I'd like to welcome the Honorable uh, Joseph Kernan, uh, former governor of Indiana, and prisoner of war during Vietnam. Mr. William George, Professor of Management Practice in, uh, at Harvard Business School. He's a former chairman and CEO of Medtronic Incorporated. In addition to this conference being student-led, we're fortunate to have the conference privately funded through the generosity of a few donors. We're uh, Admiral uh, Maurice uh, Reinskopf, we're Admiral Bob McNitt, and they're class 1938. Thanks for being here, sir, what you do. And the Hart Foundation, specifically Mr. and, Mr. Mr. and Mrs. Mitch Hart, support this conference and uh, allow us to, uh, to bring all of you in. Also, thanks to their generosity, each of you will be receiving Mr. Bill George's book, Seven Lessons for Leading in Crisis. How about a round of applause for that generosity? You know, as our chairman mentioned, this year's topic is you know, stress and leadership transforming crisis into opportunities. Well, when we uh, look at the challenges we face around the globe, with many of these challenges being true crises, uh, I think we'll find plenty of important matters to discuss. I encourage each of you to take advantage of this opportunity to learn and participate this week. It really is uh, it's for you to, to be part of groups, to uh, voice your opinion, and we appreciate uh, such a diverse group from a wide background. In addition to the gentleman I've already acknowledged, we have an incredible range of leaders contributing to this discussion. Among them, uh, former White House Press Secretary Ari Fleischer will be here, former President and CEO of the American Red Cross, Marty Evans, and one of the most experienced leaders in broadcast journalism, Mr. Tom Brokaw, just to name a few. So I look forward to joining you when I can. In fact, I'm going to stick around for the first talk. We start a little bit late, but I'm going to end a little bit early, so we should be on schedule. Uh, have a great week, and once again, welcome to the Academy. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Our first speaker this morning is Mr. William W. George. Mr. George is a professor of management practice at Harvard Business School, where he's taught leadership since 2004. He's the author of four best-selling books, Seven Lessons for Leading Crisis, True North, Find Your True North, and Authentic Leadership. In addition, Mr. George is the former chairman and chief executive officer of Medtronic, a multi-billion dollar corporation specializing in medical technology that helps the quality of life for millions of Americans daily. He has been named one of the top 25 business leaders for the past 25 years by PBS, Executive of the Year 2001 by the Academy of Management, and the Director of the Year for 2001-2002 by the National Association of Corporate Directors. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Mr. William George. Thank you, Paul. It's a great privilege to be back at the Naval Academy and have the chance to speak to this conference. I want to thank Admiral Fowler and Paul Bain, and also my good friends, Mitch and Linda Hart, who helped them underwrite this conference and provide everyone copies of the book. Uh, I think your topic is extremely appropriate for what we face in the world today because we're faced with a multitude of crises. And in my mind, all of these crises, uh, uh, the solutions all revolve around having the leaders that will make a difference. I hope you, each of you, will take it upon yourself to be one of those leaders. Uh, I 
as I say, I have great admiration for this institution. When I, uh, I went to Georgia Tech and studied engineering, and I went straight through to Harvard Business School, and when I graduated, I came to Washington and worked in the United States Department of Defense, worked for the Assistant Secretary of Defense Controller, uh, the equivalent Chief Financial Officer. And uh, when I was 25, I was asked by the then Secretary of the Navy, Pauli Nation, to come be his special assistant, which I did, and also served under Secretary of the Navy, John Chafee. So I had a, a marvelous experience at a very, very young age uh, during the midst of the Vietnam War and to, uh, during some very, very challenging times. And it was a great learning experience to watch, uh, uh, watch how leaders dealt with uh, very difficult circumstances, which are common. Uh, but let me also say that the Academy is a role model for teaching leadership. In fact, all of our service academies have become that, and many corporations are now looking to the Academy as teaching leadership. And I see in my own classroom at Harvard, I have many former military officers who have done their, their service, served five years, gone to reserves and active reserves, and uh, I find that they are the best leaders in my classroom. Now, if you ask yourself, why is that the case? Well, the answer is very simple. They've actually led something. And I think there's no substitute, as much as we want to study leadership as an academic topic, there simply is no substitute for experience in leadership. And, I think, and if you have those opportunities, you have the opportunity to become a great leader. Leadership is not about studying great leaders, uh, nor is it about learning the theories of leadership. It's about actually engaging yourself in challenging situations. And uh, I was fortunate to be at Medtronic during a period of great growth. And I, at the time, we thought we were doing a pretty good job. But I can tell you, the real test is when, when you're in a crisis. When things don't go your way, when sudden, things suddenly turn around on you and head the other way, that's the real test of any leader. There's an old English proverb that goes, a smooth sea never created a great mariner. I think all of you here at the Naval Academy know that to be the case. Uh, in fact, the thing I really always admire about the United States Navy is Naval officers, all up to and including admirals, really didn't want to spend their time in the Pentagon. They want to be out at sea. Uh, and I think that's where the action is. And I think the same is true in business and in every form of leadership. But today, in America, we're facing a leadership crisis. Uh, I refer to in business, at least, this is the lost decade of leadership. The Kennedy School of Government uh, recently completed a survey of America's uh, citizens and confidence in our leaders that was rather more than a little disturbing. 69% of the American people said that they didn't trust our leaders. 67%, even more concerning to me, said that if America doesn't get new leaders, will decline as a nation. Uh, now, it's interesting when they divided those into categories, the best leaders were military and people in medicine, doctors, nurses, and all the people who contribute to the medicine. And at the bottom of the list were, uh, not surprisingly, Wall Street, the media and politician, and then business leaders. Uh, I think the reasons are fairly self-evident of why this reaction we started the decade with, uh, with Enron, and uh, over 200 companies went through financial restatements, which really raised significant questions about the integrity of accounting, but more importantly, the integrity of our leaders. And that's when I really got involved in wanting to write and talk about leadership, because I've been in business for 33 years, culminating my 13 years in Medtronic. Uh, and then, of course, in 2008, 2009, we had the financial meltdown and recovery from that. And although the economists have told us we've passed with the eye of the storm, much like we're dealing in Haiti right now, we're dealing with the very severe aftermath. And today, uh, people may tell you the unemployment rate is 10%. The actual number is 17.3% from the Department of Labor, because that includes all the people who are looking for full-time work and cannot find full-time jobs. Please don't tell me that someone who had an eight thousand dollar a year job is now working part time at Starbucks. Uh, has has a full time has a real job to support their family. But we faced uh, for the first decade in history the stock market or since World War II the stock market was down, but more significantly the incomes were down. Uh, and so we have to ask what's happened? What what has happened? And I really do think it comes back to leadership. And I think this latest financial meltdown was a result of leaders who are practicing short-termism. In other words, they're putting their own short-term interests ahead of the institutions they serve. And to me, that's a violation of cardinal rule number one. Because unfortunately, as a society, we become a society of instant gratification. And we put more emphasis on spending 
that we have on investment. When the whole American people are willing after 9-11 to do just about anything to help their country, the president was asked, what should we do? He said, go shopping. And I think that this was an unfortunate uh, mistake to say that it's not just about spending money. It's really about how do we invest in our country in every way. And most important, how do we invest in leaders? Uh, and I think we've gotten too caught up in uh, looking at the short-term metrics and the instant analysis on the media and have lost sight of leadership it requires long-term development. For each of you to become a leader, you need to develop yourself. It's no different than a great athlete or a great musician. If you want to play the Carnegie, uh, people ask the question, are leaders born or made? I think that's the wrong question to ask. Because we're all born with gifts. We're all, each of you, born with gifts of leadership. The real question is, how are you going to develop yourself as a leader? I remember once talking to Lance Armstrong after he won the Tour de France once. And uh, here's the person with great remarkable athletic gifts. He made a statement in his book, It's Not About the Bike. He said, uh, if I had to choose between winning the Tour de France and having cancer, I would choose cancer. So I had a chance to do a friendly bike with him. I'm sure he wasn't a competitive bike ride. But, uh, and ask him, uh, were you really serious about that? Is that just something your publisher wanted you to promote? And he said, no, I'm totally serious. He said, had it not been for cancer, I never would have won the Tour de France. Because I had the gifts, but I never had the discipline. I had a terrible attitude, and he said, because I faced death and realized what it was all about, I then had to face life and become a better human being, a better father, a better husband, and a better human being. And he committed himself, and he said, you know, the real reason I went to Tour de France is not because I have more gifts than the other bikers on the circuit. It's because I bike 365 days a year, and most of you bike 270. In other words, I made that effort to develop myself. And leadership is not much different than that. You have to develop yourself as a leader. And you can study it all you want, but in the end, you really have to get out and doing it. And I really think the real issue we have is we need a new generation of leaders. And I hope you will be part of that generation of leaders who will follow what I call your true north, your most deeply held beliefs, values, and convictions. If I asked each of you to write down what your true north is, each of you, I think, could probably do that. That's really not the question. The question is, what do you do in crisis? What do you do under pressure? Do you deviate? Does the pressure become so great that you say, you know, well, we have to deviate a little bit. We can't let this information out, you know, and that's when you get in trouble. You know, if you just acknowledge your mistakes, you can avoid that problem. Or you get seduced by the rewards. The rewards, not just monetary rewards, the rewards of promotion, the rewards of recognition by your peers. Most all the leaders I've seen fail fail not because they lack capacity for leadership, but because they lose sight of their calling. They lose sight of their true north. They lose sight of the institutions they serve. And they bow to the pressure or they get seduced and pulled off their course. We all have a tendency to do that at one point in time in our lives. And so the idea is to say, well, that would never happen to me. No, it will happen to every one of us at some point in time. The question is, do you have vehicles for course correct, have you developed yourself so you can come back to your true north? Because I think what we really need, we've been choosing in the last 10, 20 years, but choosing in many elements of society, especially in business where I've devoted my life for my time, uh, we've been choosing the wrong leaders for the wrong reasons. We've been choosing people more for their charisma than their character. We've been choosing people more for their style than their substance. We've been choosing people more for their image than their integrity. Well, I'll stand here and tell you that leadership is not about charisma, it's not about style, and it's not about image. Leadership is about character. Leadership is about integrity, and it's about having the knowledge to do the substantive work. And I would like to think that everyone in this audience will become a leader of character who knows their true north and can stay true to what they believe in. Now, I'll go one step further and say no one can tell you what to believe. There's no set pattern of beliefs. Some of you say these are the values you ought to have. You have to know what you really believe at your deepest level. Because when the test comes, and it will come multiple times in your life, uh, that's when you test, you have to go back to that core set, who am I as a person? And I think leadership basically is something that comes from within you. It's not out there, it's not how, to, how you appear before the media, it's not, uh, it's not how you impress people, it's about who are you as a person. See, I think leadership has changed dramatically in the 21st century over the 20th century. 
You know, if we had the military model of leadership was widely emulated in this very hierarchical command and control model. And men are putting down command and control, but I think it's changed dramatically because the people today in organizations have changed. Basically, we have knowledge workers. I often say to people in business, the people working for you don't know more than you do, then you better get some new people. Because we've gone away from the old craftsman apprentice model. But more important than that, in spite of what the economists have told us, that people are primarily interested in money, I actually don't believe that. I think at the end of the day, most people know they'll never be wealthy, and they're really interested in making a difference. They'd like to think at the end of the day, they left something behind that made a difference. Now, each of you have chosen a career where you're going to make a difference, and I just want to urge you to stay true to that. I think the new model of leadership I can define in four words, align, empower, serve and collaborate. There's nothing more important in leadership than aligning people around the sense of the organization's mission and its values. You can write all the rules you want, but if people don't know, and a part of long global organization, don't know what the mission of the organization, what's the call and what's the purpose, and they don't know its value, then you will have significant deviations, especially under pressure. Now, the people where I teach business at Harvard say that's the soft side of leadership. Getting the numbers right is the hard side. They've got it absolutely wrong. I can tell you, having been someone that's had to lay people off and get the budgets correct, that's the easy side. At the end of the day, the decisions are pretty clear. Getting people aligned around mission and values is really hard and requires real leadership. So I want to encourage each of you to think about your leadership in that regard. The second thing, leadership today it's not about exerting power over other people. We have, in the past, we've studied power, we treat it like it's a limited commodity. I give you a certain amount of my power, here are the decision rules, you have this power. Actually, I think it's about empowering other people to step up and lead. How else is it going to be? The great organizations of the future, to the, uh, the great organizations today are all bottoms up organizations, they're not top down. Because when you think about empowerment, that's an unlimited quantity. Have, and that's the great power of the vision. People are aligned around mission and values, and they feel that sense of really making a difference. Let me tell you a little story. I was visiting a Medtronic facility a number of years ago, made heart valve. What this facility did is it took a pig's heart and it carved out the valve out of the pig's heart. About one out of ten pig's hearts produced a valve that could be substituted for the human aortic or mitral valve for people with pig, and it saved their lives. And this facility is heavily backlogged. And, uh, and so I met with a top worker in the facility, a woman named Trin, who was a Laotian immigrant, legal immigrant, who had come to the United States about five years before. And, and uh, she was thought to be the, the best person in the facility. And I'm an industrial engineer, so I'm trained about how this works. It took us 18 months to train people. So she had all her instruments on her bench. And I asked her, I said, please tell me how you do this and why you're so much more efficient than the other employees. She wouldn't let down her bench. She said, Mr. George, let me tell you something. She said, I make heart valves to save someone's lives. And she said, there are no inspectors on this line. I'm the inspector on this line. And my criteria, yes, there's a whole book of rules here, but my criteria is that valve good enough to go into my father or my husband or my daughter. And if it's not, it doesn't get by me. Because I have to send, sign my name to every single valve. And at the end of that day, the FDA can come back here five years, ten years from now and say, who made this valve? She said, you know, I make a thousand valves a year. And if one of those valves is effective, someone's going to die. Now, to you at Medtronic, 99.9% .9 of quality is pretty darn good. She said, but I could never live with that, knowing that I caused the death of another person. And she said, you know when I go home at night, you know what I think about? I think about those 5,000 people that are alive and healthy in the world today because of the heart valves I made. Now, does anyone in the audience doubt that she's an empowered person? She has no direct reports, okay? She makes about $15, each, she makes about $20 an hour, she knows she's never going to be wealthy, but she's wealthy inside. She knows her work is making a difference. Now, to me, she emulates, she represents the kind of empowered people we want in our organization, regardless of our organization. The third thing about leadership is that leadership is about service. It's not servicing the owner or servicing the bosses. It's about whom are we serving and understanding that. We are as much serving the people who work for us instead of they're there to serve us. How do we serve them? Great leaders know how to serve people. At Medtronic, we thought everyone in the organization was there to serve the patients. We were there to restore people to full life and health. How are you serving? 
you see yourself as a servant leader? Because I think if you don't, you need to rethink and recalibrate your leadership. Because the great leaders today, not the ones the media plays up, but the truly great leaders are those who are servant leaders. They realize here at the Naval Academy, you're here to serve your country. If you can't get that straight, the country's not here to serve you. Uh, I think in business, people think that they're there to show they are to serve the shareholders. They're absolutely wrong. They're there to serve their customers, their patients. They serve them. That's who we serve. And we also serve our employees. And if we do that well, then we'll have an empowered organization. Finally, leadership is about collaboration. I remember one of the great bills I have is going on CPA 61 to Ranger and watching in, in Navy, naval maneuvers back in the late 60s on very high seas, 5,000 people working together from very different areas all at the same time, doing various series of very complex operations, all had to be integrally calibrated. I said, you know, that's what we really need in an organization. We need that spirit of collaboration throughout the organization. Not that we're competing with each other, but that we know how to collaborate. So leadership in the 21st century is about aligning people around a sense of mission and values, about empowering them to step up and lead at all levels. It's about serving through your leadership. And finally, it's about creating a spirit of collaboration so that everyone can work together rather than competing with each other. I got my first exposure to leadership uh, where I was really on the line when I was 27 years old. And that's why I really believe that your theme of this conference is so important. Leadership is really about leading in crisis. I'd always wanted to go run something, and I never had that opportunity. I'd been in staff roles. So I went to work for Lynn Industries because my new boss promised he'd put me into a line position. So finally, I'm 27. Uh, I did the plan to get the company, Lit Industries, into the consumer microwave oven business. There were no microwave ovens in the home in those days. And so uh, the business ran into some difficulties in the first six months we were in the business. So I was ferreted up to Minneapolis as assistant general manager of this small $10 million division to try to get the, the business on track. The company had just shipped its first 1,100 microwave ovens. And I remember as I was packing my bags that night, the radio announcer came over and said, uh, the Surgeon General of the United States has just announced that microwave ovens may be hazardous to your health. Well, that's a great way to start a new job. And uh, we had only one problem, a microwave oven, and everyone was concerned about radiation. I found myself back in Washington arguing with the FDA about this. I remember a, a regulator there said to me, uh, and the FDA said, Mr. George, we're just trying to do you a favor and get it right before you get billions of these products out there. So when I went into business, it was mass chaos. There was no leadership. And uh, we weren't sure the product we had would meet the pending federal safety standards, which weren't in existence at that time. And I remember that our big boss came in from California, the corporate executive vice president, around 25% of the corporation, came in. And I'm the young guy presenting to him about how these microwave ovens are really safe and they have a 10,000 times safety factor built into them. We aren't sure about these federal standards. And you know what he said to me? He said, no, we're just going to recall the first 1,100 products you made. You guys can't start over. And I got frustrated with him. But you know, he probably saved the business because he made that decision. He didn't make that an analysis. He made it on intuition. He knew that was the right thing to do, that we really didn't have our act together. And I remember many nights going in the factory at 3 a.m. to see if we could start production when the workers came in at 6.30. And many times we could. We didn't know if we had a design that was stable. But I learned more in that situation. Do we make mistakes? Sure. But I learned more about leadership in that situation, gathering people and getting them focused on the task and getting the job done in a crisis when no one else was willing to step up and lead. And the reason I could do that is because everyone else was frozen in place. So that's the way you learn about leadership. Yes, you can study it. Yes, you can want to be a leader. But in the end, I think you have to actually go out and do it. So let me talk about uh, what I wrote about in my book, Seven Lessons, the whole idea of are there universal lessons we can learn about leading crisis? I actually think there are. And I think they apply to military situations. I think they apply to business. I think they apply to medicine. I think they apply to other, situ uh, other aspects of life as well. And so let me just share some of those with you this morning with some examples. Uh, lesson number one is face reality starting with yourself. Now, that's probably the hardest thing to do. People say, what's the most important lesson? First thing you have to do is face reality. Until you get people in an organization to face the reality, you're never going to solve the problem. And a lot of times it's facing your own reality that's the most difficult. It's admitting the mistakes you make, not the mistakes fixing other people's mistakes, admitting the mistakes you make so that the problem can be corrected. 
is until you can do that, it becomes very difficult to correct the problem. I remember shortly after I joined Medtronic, I uh, reorganized the company, I was number two position, had all the operations, and appointed the first president of Europe. I appointed a Dutchman who was a very competent businessman, bottom line businessman, good discipline, knew the business well, came from a subsidiary company. And uh, some people gave me a few hints, this guy is pretty rough, watch out for him. I said, that's exactly what we need, so I just pushed ahead. And uh, four months after I, uh, after I uh, appointed him, uh, our general counsel, chief lawyer, and our chief internal auditor came to my office and closed the door. i just give you a little tip. Anytime your general counsel, your lawyer comes there and closes the door, you know you're in trouble. And uh, we were in significant problems uh, because they had uncovered through an audit a bribery fund that this uh, person had been running at this subsidiary company. It had been going on for about 20 years. Uh, and then trying to own the company for four or five years, so we were fully responsible for this. So I called him and asked him to fly over to Belgium, where he had his headquarters, to come talk to me. He wanted to know why he had to fly, and I said, you'll find out when you get here. So I showed him his compliance statement. I said, you know, you signed this compliance statement. Uh, and he immediately attacked me, and he said, you know, that's the problem with you Americans. He said, you're always trying to impose your values on us Europeans. I said, no, John, these are not American values. These are Medtronic values. We have one set of standards, one set of values and ethics around the country, uh, around the world, and you violate them, so you're going to have to leave the company. Now, I can tell you that was the easiest part. Those of you who've never had to terminate anyone know it's not fun. But I tell you, that was the straightforward part. The hardest part was looking myself in the mirror and say, why did I want him in the first place? Why didn't I check out his values? Why didn't I get enough data to find out who this person really was that I could check out his values? So I had to then go back to my new, the new board of directors, which I just joined the year before. And I had to go to my new management team and say, I made a mistake. So that's the first thing you have to do. We have to face the reality, not that somebody else made a mistake, but I made a mistake. And so we could call that, we couldn't free up the organization. Because meanwhile, I was looking at saying, okay, well, he's a bad guy, but you know, who's the guy that appointed him? So think about that. Anytime someone gets promoted, who's responsible? And it often tells us what kind of person you are. So I think it's very hard often to face these kind of realities. Uh, when I was early in my life, when I was working in the U.S. Department of Defense, I saw during the middle of the Vietnam War, the top civilians unwilling to face the reality of what was going on in the ground. In part because they weren't engaged with it, part because they were looking only at statistical data. But as a result, people really missed what was happening. These were very smart, very talented people. No one would ever question their, their intellect, their commitment. That because they weren't engaged and they weren't willing to face the reality that they had moved, made some significant mistakes. And I saw uh, 40,000 people in a single building called the Pentagon where no one was willing to admit their mistakes and it led to some significant problems. I always vowed that I said, I'm going to be the first to admit my mistakes. I'll give you an example of someone that learned the hard way about his mistakes. And how his name is Kevin Scher, he's the CEO of Amgen. And uh, Kevin is a graduate of uh, this institution. And he always wanted to be a naval aviator, but he failed the eye test. His father was a naval aviator, his grandfather was. He wanted to be one too. He failed the eye test, so he wanted a nuclear power. And he tells the story of, of uh, sailing off the coast of, of Russia, uh, and a, of being under, under sea off the coast of Russia in a submarine, and, and his interaction with that. And Rick Over, which he had the, the challenge, the Admiral, which in those days was something he didn't do. Uh, and Kevin then uh, went to work for Jack Welch when he left the, uh, the Navy to, when he completed his tour, he went to work for Jack Welch at General Electric. And during the interview, Welch said to him, uh, young man, uh, when, when have you ever taken a risk? Looked like you've had a pretty soft career. And he said, well, sir, I served, uh, I was off the coast of Russia for nine months in a United States submarine. And he said, what if, and then he went back to Welch. He said, when have you ever taken a risk for someone other than other people's money? So uh, that got him, got him the job because he was willing to stand up to him. But Kevin was a star at GE and he bailed out of there because he, his ego got a hold. And he went to a company called MCI in the telephony business. He thought he could be CEO at 41 years old. And he bailed out of there and he learned very quickly he wasn't going to be the CEO. In fact, he was miserable. And here's a guy that uh, let his ego get the better of him. Good person. Ezekiel totally, and he said he spent the most three most miserable years of his life. He had truly lost his true north, he had lost his way, so to speak. 
And so uh, and he was miserable, but at a certain point in time he said, you know, I can't, I just got to suck it up. I can't just leave here. I have to go do the job. And eventually an opportunity came to go to Amgen, he where the company was. He went to the library to study that this was the world's largest biotech company. And he went to Amgen in 1992 and became number two chief operating officer. He said he didn't know anything about chemistry and biology. He had to relearn it all, went into the labs, learned from the scientists, got controller of his ego. And, uh, and then uh, he became CEO, very successful after about five years. And he's come to my classroom and worried about how fast they could grow. And then all of a sudden, a drug called Aranesp, which is their, their future drug, hit them. And Aranesp is an anemia drug. And they started getting reports and started doing some studies along with Johnson Johnson showed that in high dosage, this product and was also being heavily used off-label and much higher dosage than was prescribed, which was causing significant harm to patients. So we called all those people together to discuss this. And everyone said, you know, the problem is that got down with the FDA. If we could just fix that problem, he's the guy that's causing us this problem. And he's trying to get us to, to, to recall this drug. And Kevin finally said, you know, if you were that regulator at the FDA, how would it look to you? And they said, well, the scientists said, yeah, it would actually look pretty bad. And so Kevin tasked his top people to go solve the problem. And he gave them each an assignment, come back with him with a plan. Two weeks went by, nothing happened. Four weeks went by, nothing happened. Six weeks went by, nothing happened. After six weeks, he was sitting in a shopping mall waiting for his daughter he had to pick up and go in for an appointment. And he pulled out a piece of paper and he said, Kevin, what's your role in this whole problem? And he said, I said it, I'd write down the six I painted as the CEO of the company. He said, you know, Bill, he said, he said, you know, it's a very long list. He said, when I got back to the office the next day, I called all my people together and said, okay, now I want to tell you all the mistakes I paid with regard to this problem. Pushing too hard for growth, pushing you too hard to try to expand the drug beyond its natural constituency, pushing hard for high dosage. He said, uh, he said they were shocked that the CEO would admit his mistakes. He said, when it did, it freed up the whole organization to, uh, to take this one very seriously. And uh, then they put a plan together and said within three days he had a plan. They went back and instead of growing the business, they had to recall, uh, they had to cut back on the usage. They went to the FDA and said, well, limit the usage, we'll put a black box warning on. He said it cost $1 billion in sales, which in that business is almost all that profit. $1 billion in sales, he said, but he saved the drug, he probably saved the companies. So think about that as an example of what it takes to face your own reality. Kevin had to face his reality, not that somebody else had messed up. He had to face his own reality. Because I think most problems start with a change where people aren't willing to do that. So lesson number two is don't be apt to get the world off your shoulders. What does that mean? Well, I'll tell you, there was never a time in Johnny when I didn't feel the world, I had the world on my shoulders, like millions of patients were relying on us. We had a quality product. We had shareholders appointing the kids to college. We had 38,000 employees relying on us. But you know, it doesn't just start at the top. I had a, a young man who's a graduate of the uh, United States Military Academy at West Point, a lieutenant. Uh, I'm going to give him the name Ron. Uh, uh, excellent young man. He came from a military family. And uh, he, he, came, he wanted to be an airborne ranger, and he did become one. And uh, at a certain point in time, he tells the story. He told the whole class the story. He said that his very best friend was killed. He was company commander. And Ron was asked to step up and become the commander. So Ron took command. And then he decided that in his grief about his best friend being killed, he would just stop his grief. And he became very directive with his people. And, uh, and what he realized uh, after a few weeks of this is he had totally lost the support of his 138 people in his command. And uh, he, was, he said he was like a robot. Uh, no one could reach him. He was very distant from his own people. And he would sit inside and, and give directions. And he took that way good one carrying him out. And finally he came to his senses and realized that he had to do a total uh, rethinking of his whole approach to leadership. And he became much more humane. He shared with his men and his women uh, how he was grieving and what he was feeling at that time and, uh, and, and, uh, and allowed them to share their grief. And all of a sudden he said the power of people come together and the team totally turned around. See, he had to turn around himself before that happened. 
uh, he had to get the world off his shoulders and realize he couldn't do it himself. He couldn't just go to Rexus 138 people. He had to ask them for help and get them on board with his help. So it's really a form of, if you will, empowering them to really, but to do that, he had to be really open about what he was feeling and share with them. And by becoming one of them, he really became an excellent leader for them. Another, another example is a, uh, um, uh, one of my students who's a, who's a Marine, uh, ROTC, and uh, went to University of North Carolina. And uh, before he completed his ROTC duty, he started an organization in uh, the town of Cabrera in, uh, in Kenya. And uh, it's a slum, 750,000 people crammed in a very small area. And uh, he, uh, he was trying to do this, and he then became a Marine and a counterintelligence officer. He operated in Iraq, he operated in Afghanistan, and he had a tour in the Horn of Africa. And he, uh, he recognized, acknowledged uh, to me and to himself, important, that he was trying to do all the missions himself and not really relying on his people. He was trying to carry it out. Meanwhile, he's going back and taking his sleep time to try to keep this little organization he'd started in Cabrera that was helping poor people and helping organize people and trying to raise funds, doing that three or four hours a day or night, as the case may be. And, uh, and he said that he was on a mission with his, his people. And, uh, and he had one person sitting next to him, and he was in a truck. And uh, he was way behind time. He had to get somewhere very fast. He was going down the road. And at a certain point in time, he came over a hill. He veered off the road and headed for the cliff. And he said the only thing that saved his life is he had a rock. Big, huge problem. He said but that really to him became what had happened to him. He lost control. He was trying to do so much. And he was trying to take on so much that he was trying to do everything himself. And he had to pull back from that. And so I think if you can learn the lessons, uh, don't try to do it all yourself. You're part of a large organization. You have a team. You have people who work for you. People who work with you. You have bosses that are all part of organizations. And I think in leadership, there's a great danger of saying, I can do it myself. Lesson number three and four I'll take together is, has to do with the most important thing is getting to the root cause and recognizing most problems take a very long time to solve. And they aren't always easy to solve. That problem I told you about with Kevin Shear took a long time to solve. It couldn't be solved until you get to the root cause of the problem. I got a, uh, I've had a series of emails to one of my students, I won't give you her name, uh, but she, uh, she became CFO of a small company in Silicon Valley. And it was a startup company, not publicly held. And she started to realize something was wrong. She started seeing the president of the CEO's expense accounts, and there was a lot of unusual stuff on the expense accounts. And then she started investigating uh, some of the accounting techniques and what they said, things were going for, were going for other things that we call marketing expenses, but realized these were really not marketing expenses, they were payments being made to others. And, uh, and she tried to talk to her boss about this, and uh, he refused to talk to her about it. He just said, that, that's a problem, just go, I mean, that's not a problem, just go do it. So uh, she, she communicated back to me and said, what should I do? And I said, well, you're the chief financial officer, you have a legal obligation if the accounting is fraudulent and you're miscoding things, and this is known, and there's a question of expenses, uh, inappropriate expenses, you need to confront this. So I said, uh, what about going to the board of directors? She said, I'm not sure where they are. And so she went to the auditors, well-known, big four auditing firm. She sat down with the auditors and laid out everything for them that was going on and said, here's what's going on. And here's the inappropriate accounting that we're engaged in here. And, uh, and then, uh, then she made the decision to go to the board of directors and the accounting firm did too. And interestingly enough, uh, the chairman of the board decided that uh, there was too much money at stake here and that they couldn't disclose this publicly, so they decided to cover it up. And, uh, and so, uh, and uh, she said at that point in time, I think I need to find a way to leave. And said, you can't leave, you're implicated here. And she said, no, I have to find a way. So she did everything she could to try to get the account right and eventually did leave. But, uh, so it's not a happy story. She actually had to leave the company because there actually was something going on. So I give you that story. The root cause of that problem was basically it was not an accounting problem. It was not even an expense problem. It was an integrity problem. And it was a problem that went right to the heart is that people were trying to take the company public and they didn't want this all to come out before they took the company public. So 
people who are running the company have lost sight of what they and, uh, of what they were there for. And uh, and and take this was a long term problem. It's taken her a year to extract herself from there. Uh, you know, and she lost her job. They took care of her financially, but she lost her job. And, you know, she kept her integrity because she did the right thing. She went and you know and did the right thing and exposed her, and they did commit to correct it. But they didn't, the company did not do the right thing. So I only give you that story to say sometimes in life, things don't always go well. Sometimes things aren't fair. You know, she should have been a hero, but she wasn't. But you know what, she'll have a good career and she'll learn from that experience. And that will be with her the rest of her life. Uh, because in the end of the day, what do you have if you don't have your integrity? I'm going to give you some other lessons that more of my experience in business, I'm sure some of those. Lesson number five uh, comes from Machiavelli. I'm not a great fan of Machiavelli. I have to say up front, but it's uh, a great phrase he had. Never waste a good crisis. Rahm Emanuel's taking this statement out, so it's his, but I can tell you Machiavelli was long before he did. Uh, but Machiavelli talked about never waste a good crisis. You know why? Because in crisis, there's one organization willing to change. But things are going well. It's hard to make fundamental changes in an organization. You make them. When there is a crisis, that's when you can make the fundamental changes. Jack Welch saw that when he went to John Electric. And no one else saw the coming global competition. He went and transformed it. He was a pariah for the first eight, ten years of GE. He did he makes his revolutionary changes in the company. But he put it right and he had a 20-year run. Meanwhile, his competitor Siemens didn't do that. And they kept playing the old game. You don't make payments in Germany, but you make payments outside of Germany. And at the end of the day, they had audits that showed they had three billion, <coughs> billion with B, illegal payments that they had made to customers. And the CEO said he didn't know anything about it. Now I can tell you from my own experience, it's impossible not to know about it. Actually, the successors one started these audits. And so, but Welch set up this system in GE. He was a very tough guy, but he set up a system called high performance, high integrity. And anyone whose values didn't measure up to the company, they had the performance, didn't have the values, they had to leave the company. And I think that's what it really takes, you know. And he used, he actually created a crisis of coming global competition to actually get out in front of it and created a company that could sustain itself, whereas others could not. Another example is General Motors, which decade after decade would never face the reality of the problems that was not making cars that people wanted to buy and playing the short-term financial game and never really faced the reality and never took advantage of crisis. They had a period where they had foreign imports were limited and in, in, instead of fixing the car, they were the price. Meanwhile, Ford goes outside the country, brings in Alan Mulally from Boeing. Mulally run the commercial engine business or commercial aircraft business at Boeing, comes into the company and first thing he does, he goes and he borrows $32.5 billion. No, $23.5 billion. And the stock market said, boy, things must be really in trouble here at Ford. And, uh, but you know, Malali said, you know, we're just getting ready for the coming crisis. So when the crisis hit a year ago, automobiles went off the road, and uh, General Motors had no money and wanted to claim bankrupt. Ford could stay independent. And today, Ford has $23 billion of cash in the bank. But more importantly than that, they started three years earlier to get the car right. So they used the crisis to their benefit to try to get the company right. And today they've got a three-year head start on making more fuel-efficient cars and making cars that are more aligned with what people want. And, uh, and so I think that those are kind of classic cases of people that really know how to use the crisis to put things right. And I'm sure you can think of your own experience when you've been through crises is the best opportunity to get it right. Lesson number six is you're in the spotlight, follow your true north. What do I mean by that? Well, you know, when the pressure's on, it's going to be on everyone in the There's going to be time in your life when you're really under the spotlight. You may think you're not, you can hide under the radar. Uh, in today's world, communications move so fast, so lots of information on the internet. There is no such thing as keeping things a secret. I think the only way you can run an organization today is be fully transparent. Get the information out, hold it up there, and then go fix the problem. Because until you can acknowledge that, back to lesson number one, until you face the reality, you can't fix the problem. So I think it's extremely important to recognize that you have to be open, you have to be transparent. I'd say to people, you're never going to get fired here for having a problem. Please don't have it twice. 
But you never get fired for having a problem. Because we all have problems. We all make mistakes. You won't get fired for making a mistake. I made a lot of mistakes in my career. But you will lose your job if you cover one up. And covering one up means not coming forward with a full story. Those of you who are engineers here at the academy know, or engineers elsewhere, know that you know the worst thing you do in engineering is have a problem and and fix a symptom and not get to the root cause and create other problems that go with it. But the same thing is true in organizational life as well. You have to get to the root cause, but you know you can only do that if you have the full mass. And Medtronic is scared the heck out of me that we wouldn't know the whole problem because oh we got that problem fixed. Actually, that problem is harming people. Until you get the information out on the table, and I would say to people, we can get the best people in the world to solve this problem, but we can't solve any problem we don't know about. So a big organization is really important that those come to the surface. That needs to have to be transparent. And in today's world, there's no such thing as these are internal communications, these are external. Everything is worked together because with blogs, with the internet, everything is known internally, it's known externally. I know I was giving a talk to people like this and they're trying to so-call chairman's briefing and explaining a problem we're having. And I got through the problem solution and I went our problem presentation and I went to the solution. And I got back to my office and I found Reuters had the whole problem laid out at 929. My talk didn't end until 10 to 10. And so Reuters had the story from one of our employees before that. Well, that's just the way life is very transparent. If you think you've covered things up, forget it. People have tried to do that. And the history is replete with failed leaders who tried to cover things up. Best to get them out on the table and admit your mistake. But you're in spotlight. Why don't people do that? It seems so obvious. Doesn't it? You know what? They don't follow the true north. They lose sight of that. They think you know, well, no one will know. We can kind of cover this one up a little bit. We cannot make this transparent. This company that's going to come public, that'll all come out. You know, but we think we don't have to be honest. We actually do. And you know, no matter how bad the problem is, it's never as bad as what you're going to create worse problems by not being transparent. So when you're in the spotlight, that's the real test of following your true north. Because everyone's looking at you. And again, it's not just about money. It's about your reputation. It's about how you're seen. And if you create an image for yourself of a wholly successful person never makes a mistake, that image is going to be destroyed. Probably the best thing to have happen to you. You know, to recognize you're human like everyone else. But when you're in the spotlight, that's your real test. Give you a couple examples drawn from the business world. One is Mattel toys. A number of years ago, uh, a consumer found lead in children's toys. And these were played by little kids, like my grandchildren, one and a half, two and a half years old. And so Mattel, who had not been testing, went tested and confirmed there was lead in the toys. And so they recalled 14 million toys. They did the right thing. Then the CEO, Robert Eckert, got called in front of Congress and said, Mr. Eckert, why did this happen? He said, don't blame Mattel. It's those Chinese contract manufacturers. We get all of our products, they're all made in China, 100% made in China, and they're the ones responsible. Okay, whose name was on the product? Was it a Chinese manufacturer? No, it was Mattel. Who designed the product? Who was responsible for the quality control? Who was responsible for the inspection? You know, you can't blame someone else for your problems, which he did. And of course, he set up a whole round of xenophobia. Uh, you know, let's, let's go after the Chinese. One senator said, I suppose now made in China is a warning label. And uh, thought he was being funny, but you know, Mattel had no other options. All the problems. <coughs> the head of his largest supplier actually committed suicide because he felt so responsible. And, you know, it was Mattel who didn't do the job. So in the spotlight, he dumped. He didn't take responsibility for the problem. Another example is David Nealman, the CEO of JetBlue, founder of JetBlue. Uh, David came to my classroom and told his story this, this fall. We wrote a case on it. He founded JetBlue with passion for customer service. Many of you who flown JetBlue know they really are, want to give you great value with really good customer service. Not a lot of luxury, not a lot of specials, but uh, very good value. So, uh, on Valentine's Day 2007, there was a huge storm at Kennedy Airport where they had their planes. And people wound up sitting on runway up to 10 hours. And Mattel's reputation for customer service just went up in flames, and all the media was focusing on this. So Neilman went down to the control room to see what was going on, and he found it was mass chaos. And he was not the operating guy. His operating guy was on vacation in Florida, wouldn't even come back, and he found it was mass chaos. What did he do? First thing he did is he put out uh, a video and, on his website and apologized to all the customers who had been harmed from this. He said, this is not our standard. The next day, they had to cancel a thousand flights. He said, we're apologizing to all 
Then he went on the Letterman Show, he went on the Today Show, he went on CN, CNN, CNBC, all the shows, some said 17 different shows, and apologized on behalf of the company. And, uh, and then he did something very unusual, put together a customer bill of rights, which said if you get harmed by JetBlue because you're tied up, you're held on a runway inappropriately, uh, you're going to get this fund, and they created a $25 million fund. Now, the irony of this story is that he had a board member, and a couple of board members who didn't think much of this. They thought he was harming the company by telling the truth. And so, in the end, they decided that he should actually give up his CEO title and eventually leave the company. And uh, so he came to class and explained this, what had happened, and he's now founded an airline in Brazil called Azul. So it wasn't always a happy story like our friend Patricia uh, with the uh, IT company in, in Silicon Valley. It wasn't always a happy story. He came to my classroom and got asked about the students, about my students about this. He said, you know, yeah, I lost my job, but I kept my integrity. And at the end of the day, what's more important? What do you really want to do in life? What's more important? You can always get a job. You can always find a new place to go. But you can't get your integrity back. Once you give up your integrity, you don't get it back. So lesson number seven is go to the heart of this conference. How do you take crises and turn them into opportunities? I think this is something you want to really think about because oftentimes in a crisis is an opportunity to go on offense. I'm going to give you some business examples of people who did this. Uh, Sam Palmasano took over IBM when the company was coming out of a crisis and he wanted to make a company that was much more collaborative and he did a values jam with over 340,000 employees in the 72-hour values jam to decide what should the values of IBM be. And he got tremendous support from all the people for the values. Now the values wouldn't surprise you. They were integrity, customer service, and innovation. But what it was is he got the support of his people. So if you want on offense, and if you look at what IBM's done to create a collaborative model, he wanted to take the organization from an organization which was a top-down, task-oriented organization to a collaborative organization where everyone in this giant 400,000 person organization pulled together. Well, if you study the history of IBM in the last five years, you find out they've done extremely well. It's easy to convert it. And I know when I first started telling this story, people would say, well, Palmasano, you know, his stock, IBM stock price is not doing so well. And I talked to him about it, and he said, you know, I know that it's going to take my whole team for five to seven years to change the culture of this man organization. He went on offense to do that. Another well-known case is Steve Jobs at Apple. When Apple was totally failing, and he couldn't make it in the computer business. He brought out the iPod iTunes, now the iPhone, now they've redone the computer line, now all of a sudden they're winning, but only because he went on offense to solve that problem. So I think when you're feeling in the middle of a crisis, not just time to hunker down and pull back, that may be the time you need to transform the company. Medtronic faced a similar situation 10 years ago when the growth that we've had for 13 years totally went out of the business, the air went out of the balloon, and we had a choice either to pull back or go on offense. We had the courage to go out and do about $14 billion in acquisitions and forever to transform the company from a pacemaker company into a medical technology company. But only because we were willing to, uh, to take the risk of going on offense. So many times, in a crisis, you need to do that to figure out, and there are great military stories about battles that have been fought when people didn't just play defense, but they figure out how to go on offense. And what is that offensive force that can transform your organization and get everyone with you to have the sense we're winning again. We're not just not losing. We're on the offense and winning. So let me conclude by saying that I really believe that a crisis may be your defining moment. And when you find yourself in a crisis, maybe you may face crisis in your personal life. Uh, I faced one a number of years ago when I was en route to be CEO of a company called Honeywell. And uh, I was so caught up in that that I was playing the game, I was playing the corporate game, I was even wearing cufflinks, which I don't wear, and trying to impress the board of directors, trying to impress management. And uh, uh, I remember one day I was driving home to my, to my house, and I looked at myself. Now at this time, my wife and I have been married about 17 years. We have two kids in high school. We have been lived in Minneapolis for years. We're very happy. And I looked at myself in the mirror, and I was miserable. Now how could you be miserable? and you have everything going for it. So I went home and told my wife what I was feeling. She said, Bill, I've been trying to uh, tell you this for a year. You just didn't want to listen. 
is the person closest to you that really understands you the best. You know why I was miserable? Because I was losing it. I was losing my sense of true north. I was working so hard to become CEO of this big organization that I was pressing so hard that I was losing sight of what I had wanted to be since I was your age of a value-centered leader. I always wanted to be a value-centered leader that could be that person to stay true to his values. And yet here I was in my 40s and I was losing it. At that time, I turned Medtronic down for jobs three times to be president chief operating officer over a 10-year period of time. Probably because I had this idea I was going to be head of a really big company and I was letting my ego take over from my sense of value. So I called Medtronic back and I remember talking to the founder about the mission of the company. I said, you know, this is where I should have been all along. This is a company that really knows about its values and mission. Sure, the company, the whole company, I mean, number two, it's a third of the size of the sector I'm running at Honeywell right now. That doesn't matter. What really matters is are we doing something that's really worthwhile? And I remember walking into the building the very first day and it felt like I was coming home. Coming home to a place I'd never been before. I'd never even been inside the building. You know why? Because I felt like it was with a group of people where we could work together, I could learn from them, they could learn, hopefully, both from me. But together to really make the difference. So I want to challenge you in closing and say, what are you going to do in your life to make a difference? How are you going to make a difference in the world? Robert F. Kennedy said during his lifetime, few will have the greatness to bend history itself. Now, there may be one or two of you in the audience will have the greatness to bend history itself. But he went on to say, each of us, that's the opportunity to make the difference, to commit to a small series of action in our own environment, to make a difference. And the sum total of all those actions we've written in history of this generation. What I hope for from your generation is that you will be one of that small group of people to really make a difference in your environment. And all of you, all of us collectively, can work to make this world a better place. Mark Mead once said, never doubt the power of a small group of people to change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever can. So don't think of yourself as someone that has no power. Things come to you can't make a difference. You can make a difference in your life. You can commit yourself to a value, a life where you're true to your value, true to your belief. You follow your true north. And at the end of the day, you can look back and tell your family, and tell your favorite granddaughter, you know, I did the best I could and I made a difference in my way. I used the gifts I had. I led in the way I could. Because each of you is called to be a leader. So I want to challenge you today to think about how can you be the very best leader you can be to make a difference, to make this world a better place. Thank you very much.